I am exactly where I need to be in this moment. I am in complete harmony with those around me who share this moment with me. I contribute only truth and love to those around me. I am being used as a beacon of light to transmit God's divine purpose to others. I will bring peace to this moment. Now let there be truth, love, light, and peace. When one meanders about her tedious life in oblivion, she is likened to being asleep. Yet, there are moments in such a life that are requisite in her awakening. These moments are also known as visions, and if one can maintain vigilance during these moments, one may begin to unravel the tightly woven thread of her life's purpose. And of course, as with anything in life, when one first awakens to a new beginning, she must strengthen her muscles of awareness. This gets easier with time. And when one strengthens a certain muscle, it is nearly impossible for the other muscles to be neglected. Welcome to Vision Class. The web-based open classroom that helps its students interconnect to achieve their visions and find their life's greater purpose. Students can join Vision Class by simply logging on to YouTube and subscribing to the Vision Class channel. For a duration of 12 weeks, Vision Class will air a one-hour lecture every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, beginning Friday, June 7, 2013. So to stay abreast of what's going on in class and to always be aware, just remember you just want to go to our Facebook or Google Plus pages and you want to download the syllabus. Or you can download the syllabus directly by clicking on the link below. We have had some technical difficulties with downloading the syllabus, especially from Android phones. But in which case, if you're having any difficulties, never hesitate to email me at sugarfreemail at rocketmail.com where I will answer questions and I will also be available to submit to you the syllabus syllabus if you are having issues with downloading it. There are six class texts you will need for vision class. Create a visualization by Shakti Gawain. Write it down, make it happen by Henriette Ann Clauser. The Isaiah Effect by Greg Braden or A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. The Spontaneous Healing of Belief by Greg Braden and The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. The whole purpose of vision class is to interconnect, is to share, is to gain everyone's insight and testimonials such that your own vision is fueled. We want you not only to find your visions in life, but we want to use those visions as points on a map to help you figure out your life purpose, your life path. Vision class is updated constantly with information and changes that are vital to each student's success. So it is important that students remain vigilant of these updates on their own. By accessing our Facebook and Google Plus sites, students can find everything from the course syllabus to free downloadable texts by the mere click of a button. To access all Vision Class links for Facebook, simply click on the Notes section. To access all Vision Class links for Google Plus, simply click on the About tab at the top of the page and scroll down to the Links section. Students can also access the Vision Class calendar from one of the aforementioned sections, which allows you a click glance of all dates, times, and assignments for vision class. For your daily assignments, you'll need three notebooks to get started. A notebook of any size to be utilized as a journal labeled as the legacy book. A small notebook that is portable to carry with you at all times labeled as the intention book. And a medium to large size notebook to help you take notes and complete class assignments 
labeled as the Vision Book. You will also need a presentation board of any kind, which you will update throughout class with inspirations and visions you hope to achieve in your life, newly titled the End Vision Board. This class is not, I will say it a million times, if you've never heard me say it once, you're going to hear me say it now. This class is not about what you're able to accomplish, okay? It is about what you do with your time. So it's not just, hey, I'm able to cover all the text material, Shira, now what? Because you can read all these books all day long and never become aware of your reality. No, this class is about how you connect to yourself, how you connect to your creator. How do you do that? By what you put into the class. This is about how to interconnect with your fellow students and find a way that works for you such that this becomes a habit. And once this way of life becomes a habit for you, you will notice how easy it is to incorporate the elements of this class into your life. Today in vision class, we discuss recovering a sense of abundance and how to use gratitude to activate our visions. Our discussion will focus on a new earth. Today's reading comes from The Artist's Way, Week 6, pages 105 through 115, and Finishing a New Earth or the Isaiah Effect. For today's assignment, continue morning pages, artist date, and jotting dreams and visions in your vision book. Continue printing photos and working on your envision board, focusing on readings, creating a gratitude list and posting on Facebook or Google+, and preparing your questions for our midterm discussion. Our midterm discussion will be available at the Ustream link below on Sunday, July 21st from 9.30 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, not immediately following the discussion today as was originally denoted on our syllabus. Check Facebook and Google Plus for updates. Our midterm discussion topics and questions are available on Facebook Notes page and Google Plus About page, whose links are listed in the description box below. Last, after the midterm discussion, post your follow-up thoughts or links to your personal blog with any thoughts to Facebook or Google+. Welcome to week six of vision class. My name is Shira, if you don't already know. Different background, different lighting, different cinematography. That's because um, I'm reaping my abundance right now. I actually received the equipment to make a production studio. You guys don't see it right here, but there are there's lighting and this is a new camcorder. So everything's clearer, everything feels more ambiance. I can sit further away from the camera and still capture my points because the, the microphone is better. So that's all thanks to you. And since week six is about gratitude, we're gonna get right into it. So we're talking about abundance, gratitude, week six, right? Um, we talked about other ways of activating your vision last week, and now we're continuing on with the gratitude layer. Um, the gratitude concept is not necessarily uh, encapsulated in our readings for this week. However, the concept of, of abundance is encapsulated in the chapter uh, six of The Artist's Way. So that being said, when we talk about gratitude and abundance, it will sort of be a, a semi-separate aspect of this lecture. Um, the point is still that you're continuing to read whether um, you're doing a new earth or you're finishing the Isaiah effect and next week we will actually start talking about the Isaiah effect and you'll have catch-up time. So if you haven't caught up on your readings or your assignments or if you really haven't done all of the artist date, <laughs> next week and the following week are the times to do that. It's also time for midterm. So. For those of you who are wondering about the midterm and how it is comprised, we're not going to necessarily give out grades or anything like that, but the midterm is literally 
a time for us to discuss everything that we've learned thus far. Um, so not only will there be office hours this weekend, there will also be the midterm, which is from 9.30 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the link listed below at Ustream. Um, that being said, what you're gonna do is go on your Facebook or Google Plus account because right now the links that I can list below are very limited. Um, YouTube tends to truncate the links and not allow people access. What you're going to have to do is log on to Facebook or Google Plus, whichever, if you've got, um, if you have a Gmail account, which you must to have a YouTube account, then you can simply log into Google Plus at the link that is below and you can search on the about page for the link to our midterm discussion questions and discussion topics. So you'll just have a gist of what we'll be going over in um, the lecture, excuse me, the discussion for the midterm exam. So uh, all that's gonna happen is we're just gonna talk. We're just going to kiki about different topics that we've learned thus far. And um, if you have any questions and lecture, or excuse me, if discussion goes over, it's absolutely fine. We wanna try to cover weeks one through six and I will try to be a moderator and keep us on task. All right, so it's time to check in. Tell us, you don't just need to check in for week six, but tell us how your entire journey has been thus far. Have you been doing the work? It's the most important aspect of this class. A lot of times people think that lecture is enough or reading is enough. It's not enough. The work is enough. The work which is listed in your syllabus is what you need to do in order to stay on top. And of course, if you've continued on with some of the exercises that I recommend at the end of each lecture, let us know how you're doing with those. You will reap what you sow. So if you continuously labor over your seed, it's going to grant you a big return. So let us know on Facebook and Google Plus how you're doing. So check in whether or not you use the guidelines from the artist's way to check in or you just want to check in and tell us how you've been doing in general. We appreciate and welcome any and all sharing that you want to do. talking about gratitude and abundance and we're also going to talk to Tay Queen who's going to break down etymology and time for us which are huge concepts um, and she's so eloquent and articulate that I think that even if you had no idea what I was saying you'll have every possible idea with what she about what she's saying all right so um, we'll be doing that this week but first let's talk about gratitude gratitude is the idea that you are thankful for what you have in order to manifest more of what you do not have. And of course, that's important to us who are trying to manifest our visions in order to achieve our life's purposes. Now, the reason why you cannot activate your vision without abundance is because your life's purpose is interconnected with the life's purposes of other individuals. And without understanding that fundamental concept of your connectedness as an individual to the piece of the whole, then you cannot activate your vision because you simply assume that your vision is only yours. You see, when you manifest your vision, when you manifest your life's purposes, you're massaging other people's life's purposes and visions into existences or their awareness of what their visions and life purposes are. For example, Oprah, through Oprah's show, many people have been able to manifest their life's purposes and, and their visions as well. How have they been able to do this? Not only has she brought on a plethora of authors, but she's brought on a plethora of people who have manifested their visions. Right? The lady from Spanx or the guy who decorates um, utilizing uh, foliage, right? Or people such as Serena Williams. She talks about people living their dreams all the time. This creates an idea that other people can manifest their visions too. Why? Because many of these people have come from hum humble beginnings just like you and I. So by you activating your, uh, your vision with abundance, right? Through gratitude, you create this abundant cycle in the world. In fact, you know what? I'm going to show you a technique right now that explains this concept. And hopefully after trying this technique and exercise out, uh, you will be able to manifest abundance in your life. One of the 
things that I've really started to do religiously, um, I do it religiously is I do what's called gratitude cards and the reason I started doing these were because of course they're just thank you notes at the end of the day but I like to give them a different vibe when I call them gratitude cards so one of the things that I do is I write gratitude cards so I have an arsenal of gratitude cards right now and I just love to buy them whenever I think I see something cute or when I'm running low or on an artist date I'll just buy thank you cards and um, of course you know you say thank you for example like my daughter had her birthday so of course you know I put I got thank you cards but I mean even something I mean even if you wrote your thank you card on this paper just the idea that you are giving of yourself to someone else and recognizing how they have given themselves unto you is just truly a priceless feeling. Um, you know, people don't expect thank you cards all the time. They just expect you to say the words thank you, but to not know that they're gonna be receiving a gratitude card is really um, a nice treat for them. You can go to Target. You can just buy these for a dollar. I bought these, there's 10 of them, six of them, just kidding. And you know, I probably purchased these at like, uh, a craft store but you know I get things that speak to my personality so that when people have them they usually want to keep them because it's like all about me ha 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 just kidding but it feels like I gave them this card right so you know this feels like me this feels quirky like me and I just um, I mean I have them everywhere so really it's important um, and I don't like to give everybody the same cards so I really like to take my time and I like to do them in batches and the reason I like to do my gratitude cards in batches is because thankfully enough God has blessed me with so many people to, to give themselves to me that I have enough people to do batches every time I do gratitude cards but that's how it works I mean at first you're just sending out one uh, card and it multiplies I mean all of a sudden you're receiving everywhere and you can always find a way to give back even if somebody helped you uh, to the grocery store that's a gratitude card or I took a private lesson from an instructor who I uh, value very much but when someone gives of themselves, they're creating a fractal in the universe upon which a pattern now emerges and begins to build upon itself. So every time someone takes out of themselves, okay, to give to someone else, to, to donate to someone else, you have to perpetuate that cycle. So if someone gives to you, it's only, it's only fair to give back, even if it's your gratitude, that is simply enough because your acknowledgement of what it took energetically for that person to give to you is priceless. So I challenge you, I challenge you, I challenge you. Write five thank you cards today, now, tomorrow. Make a list, put it in your intention book and um, decide who you're gonna thank. Even if it's just thanking, you know, the mailman for bringing you your mail. Do you know what that's going to do for the mailman's day or the, the mailwoman's day? I mean, th just think about it. Just think you doing your job every day. Think how fulfilling and how much meaning would be added. Uh, think of how filling it would be or how much meaning it would add to your day to receive a thank you card from somebody just out of the blue, right? So those are the people who you might even wanna start with on your list. If you can get up to 10, 10 is great. If you can challenge yourself to do 15, do 15. Do five more than you thought you'd do. So if you didn't think you were gonna do any, just do five. And if you say, I can do five, I probably couldn't do 10, then do 10. This is my task to you, um, to, to find five or more people that you can thank and that you can buy cards for. You know, make an artist date out of it. Go get the stamps, have a fun experience, listen to good music, um, eat something good that day. Uh, give yourself the opportunity when you go shopping to really go to a place you like, whether it be Papyrus, which is really expensive but fun, or Target, or even Walmart. Just where, go to a place that you feel really good about spending your money at for other people to, to receive some joy and some gratitude. And I guarantee you, well on your way to being abundant in your life. Plus, no, let me put this in the middle. Plus, when you give to somebody, they wanna give more. Maybe to you, maybe to others, but when you give back, whether it be to them or to others, but when you give gratitude back to the universe, because that's all you're doing, you're not just giving it to an actual person, you're putting it back in the universe. Like I said, you're creating a fractal. What starts happening is you're giving building blocks back. So there's actually something to work with when people um, come into contact with you. It's really a powerful tool.
Okay, so you all just saw a video of me doing thank you cards or gratitude cards. This is very important. Now, this is just one concept. All of us are creative, so we're going to all figure out new ways to um, to reiterate this concept or to reinstate this concept into our lives in different ways, right? So maybe we are going to show someone gratitude by giving them $20. Or perhaps we're going to show someone gratitude by um, letting them have the day off and watching their kids. Whatever your creative method is, you've got to find ways this week of instituting gratitude into your life. If you do not find it, okay, again, you are not, you, you are not practicing the techniques that will help you manifest your vision. Let me give you another um, scenario. A lot of times we don't understand that life is constant vigilance. It's always work. Granted, the work that we do is going to be fulfilling. It will always be work. There will be very little time when we do not perceive our, life, our life's work as work. Now, what do you mean by this, Shira? I spend hours doing vision class. I spend hours and days doing vision class. It never ends. It is a constant gratification process when I do vision class, however, because I am pumping energy back into my life by doing this type of work because the work is satiating to me. So when you find work, it must be gratifying, right? It must be something that you are thankful that you're doing at every moment. And it's something that you do not take for granted. Even the job that I have now, I go to my job, I go to volunteering, and I'm grateful every time because I feel fulfilled in what I'm doing. And that is the key to what your life's work must be. So when you are pursuing your visions and thus finding your life's purpose, there has to be a level of understanding that you are grateful for what you are actually doing or else there is no reason in doing it. And in fact, it's not contributing to the whole. It's taking away from the whole. way Julia Cameron discuss, discusses recovering a sense of abundance. Um, she also cautions that this week may feel volatile to you. Um, I'm pretty sure all of these weeks have been feeling volatile to us, but nonetheless, she talks about God in terms of being our, our great creator. And again, we talked about this last week, but our limiting beliefs about God. So a lot of times we are willing to accept that God will grant us a job, let's say, of something that we necessarily don't love, but nonetheless, it's a job and we like it. So, okay, whatever, we go to our jobs, but then we, we look up and we actually hate our jobs. But we don't think that God's gonna give us a job that we actually like, right? We talked about being grateful for the job and having a sense of gratitude at the job and a sense of fulfillment at the job. Well, if your job is feeling is, is having giving you a fulfilled feeling, a lot of times we don't believe that it is even possible for us because why would God give us a job that we actually like? right? Uh, God, in our perception of God, is extremely um, stringent and like that of a dictatorial parent. But it seems to make very little sense because the, the blessings seem skewed for some people. Some people find the greatest uh, joy in doing everything that they do, yet others do not. So what is the difference? Why would God want for some to have joy and fulfillment in their jobs and not others? And it's, a self, and it's this limiting belief of God that continues to perpetuate the trap that we set for ourselves every day when we wake up thinking that there's nothing we can do about our lives. I just received a text from a young lady who told me that her life, her life sucked and that she didn't want to hear anything about positivity right now because it sucked. And the reason that you don't want to hear anything sometimes is because you don't want to take responsibility. Like I said, it is work. You know, to do vision class and to make sure it's on time, which is not always on time, that takes responsibility. That takes me kicking myself in the seat of my pants and saying to myself every day, what are you going to do about vision class today? There's not one day that goes by that I can do nothing about vision class, whether it be I read some of a book or whether it be I take notes on the book 
or whether it be I actually record and edit a video. Some days are filled with thousands of things to do. Some days I give myself a break. And in fact, she talks about this. She talks about luxury in your life, right? So in order for you to do this type of life's work, which is going to feel monotonous at times just because we don't take a break in between what we're doing, she said, fill your life with luxury. Luxury doesn't have to mean monetary luxury. It could also mean um, temporal luxury, right? You're affording yourself time to do something. Perhaps it is a luxury of space, giving yourself, um, allotting yourself some sort of a spatial, uh, you know, luxurious item. item. What would that mean, Shira? She said, for example, clearing off a bookshelf for yourself or a, a windowsill. That might be your spatial luxury, but it is the idea that you must take luxurious time to yourself or you must give yourself luxury or you must pamper yourself with something. Uh, for me, you already know that my luxury item every single, at least once a month is this, my nails. They're extremely important to me, um, not because they're nails, not only are nails important to me in general, but it's the concept of being in the salon, watching my surroundings, um, getting the color put on that I'm going to look at for the next two or three or four weeks. I mean, there's a lot that goes into the pampering of my nails, but for me, nails are important. Okay, my eyebrows right now, you can't tell because I've done them. My eyebrows underneath here look like a knitted woolly sweater for a big and tall man. That's what my eyebrows look like underneath this makeup, but you won't know that because I like to pamper. But nonetheless, Eyebrows aren't my thing. Getting my hair done isn't my thing as much as getting my nails done are my thing. Some of your guys' pampering is something else. Buying a pair of shoes, it's up to you. Of course, you're gonna have to read uh, the artist's way to figure out different ways to pamper. One really important um, concept to know is that Julie Cameron and Eckhart Tolle speak very differently about playtime. Um, Eckhart Tolle speaks about playtime, as you'll find out um, later, as enjoyment, right? And Julie Cameron speaks a bit about it in terms of luxury. Eckhart Tolle also talks about having as a sense of the ego's renewal of itself. We talked about this last week. And for many of us, we don't understand how the two concepts interconnect. This is the time where I, as the teacher, am going to interject my um, assertion right here in between the authors and you. Now, authors are going to speak however they speak. They may speak literally, they may speak metaphorically, and they may speak with simple intention. They may not say everything exactly as they should have said it, would have liked to have said it, must say it, ought to say it. They're still going to, to utilize their, their terminology in order to help you understand things because they have to use terminology. There's no way to write a book without terminology. Nonetheless, the author has their own tone and voice that they're going to use through their writing to talk to you, right? Just as I'm talking to you in my voice and you speak to someone in your voice, the authors write in their voice. It doesn't necessarily mean that you must agree with everything they say, nor does it mean that you must analyze and break down everything they say. Some things are meant for face value, some things are meant for introspection, and some things are meant to just be. The way that I look at it is there is very rarely a contradictory statement that is made amongst the authors, but there are contradictory interpretations of the authors. I told a viewer this uh, last week, when I read these books, I don't read these books the same way I believe. I don't read these books the same way that other people read these books. What I mean by that is when people read books, they often read the book from front page to the last page and they read it through left to right. They absorb some of the content 
and they go on about their day. Perhaps they interpret some of the content and they like it or they don't like it, but nonetheless, that's typically the way a person reads a book. I don't read a book that way. I do read a book from front cover to back cover and I do read it left to right just as other people do, but I don't tend to interpret the content the entire time. What I like to do is I like to read through the content. And what that means for me is when I'm reading a book, whether it be a book by, Nazi, by a Nazi German uh, scholar or it be by a, a spiritual leader, I'm going to read the book the same way. And this is why. We talked about last week knowledge as being the second layer of activating your, uh, your visions, right? Well, why, Shira, can you read books, you know, why could you read Mein Kampf the same way that you would read the I Ching? I can read both, both books the same way because knowledge is power and because knowledge is in everything, right? I could, learn, I could learn just as much from this couch as I could from the Bible if I were looking at it correctly. Real talk. So when I read a book, I don't just sit there and read it from cover to cover and assume I know everything the author is saying. Instead, I try to, to understand the author as if I were the author because anything that that, that author writes is part of the whole right? It's just a fragment of the whole. My point of view is just one point of view out of all of the point of views that could ever exist throughout time by every individual. Mine is just one. But because I understand that, and because when I look at you, I understand that your point of view is yours just the way that mine is mine, then I can understand you better. I mean, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm still going to have some ego in me. But in that way, that's how I read books. And that's how I approach the books. So when you read the book and you, and you read Eckhart Tolle talking about the ego as wanting and having in mind, and then you read in the same breath, Julia Cameron talks about having things that are yours, right? And you say, well, isn't that the ego? That's where your ego has done too much analyzing. Now, I know that's very difficult for people to understand. How can you separate your ego from yourself and just read the books that way? But it does come. As long as you continue doing the work, that comes. Trust me, this is how I got to where I am in terms of being able to, to, to stutter. I got to where I am in terms of being able to read literature like that because I allow the literature just to exist as a piece of literature amongst the whole with no judgment. So no matter what I'm reading, no matter whether I agree with the author or not, because I typically, because I typically don't agree with these authors in their entirety anyway. I never do, but they would never agree with me in my entirety either way. But nonetheless, you can begin to interpret what they're saying based off of what you understand about the world when you have that level of openness, when you have that level of uh, being, you can just read these texts and understand what the author's intention is, no matter who the author is, no matter what the subject matter is, right? You cannot judge the text as you read it. It cannot affect you. It cannot affect you emotionally. We will talk about this later uh, when we talk about discernment, but nonetheless, I just want to put that out there because a lot of you may be reading some of these books and not understanding uh, what the authors are saying because it seems contradictory. And instead of getting caught up in the intention of the author, we get caught up in the wording, right? So speaking of wording, perfect segue, uh, we're going to actually get some, get some insight from Tay Queen as to etymology, how words are derived, how words get the meaning that they get in today's uh, society, the historical implication of words, and what that means for how we utilize language uh, to put a spell on ourselves, to actually keep us from reading in the intentive way, in the attentive way, and instead we read in an analytical way. She'll talk about all of this and I will come back and uh, piggyback on her as soon as you listen to this message from our field expert, Tay Queen. It's your girl Tay Queen and I'm here to speak to you about spelling. Now, I'm going to speak to you about spelling from a dualistic perspective, okay? Yes, I'm going to talk about spelling in the terms of, yes, a term that you probably know, most familiar with, 
the way you spell a word, the, the sequence of letters in a word that is used to spell that word properly, right? Or quote unquote properly. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about spelling and then I'm also going to talk about spelling from the perspective of spelling as, as if I were to cast a spell upon you or a witch cast a spell. You understand? So, and you're going to be like, uh, what do the two things have to do with each other? And I'm going to tell you exactly how they do. So, by now, we have talked about affirmations. We have utilized affirmations, hopefully. <laughs> we have utilized affirmations. And we are hopefully seeing some changes in our, in our atmosphere around us by utilizing affirmations. Which is great and which is awesome. That's what we want. But if some of you are not, this video may provide a bit of insight as to why it is a little bit harder for us to manifest things, especially using the language of English. Now, why do I say English? Because English, those who may not be familiar, English is technically a bastardized language. What does it mean as a bastard? What does a bastardized language mean? A bastardized language means that it is not a proper language. And what I mean by proper, English did not does not have many set rules, and the rules that are set always have exceptions. Have you ever wondered why? Okay, that's based off of the history of the language. The language is an amalgamation of several different base languages, French, um, Latin, um, Greek, um, Germ German, like different Germanic languages and at different points. And then it's also an amalgamation of those languages at different time periods. <laughs> yeah, it goes it real deep. And, um, so, in order to actually figure out a word, like, well, have you ever been on a spelling bee and then the child says, um, can you please use that word in a sentence? Now, you might be thinking, oh, that's for homonyms when a word means, says, sounds the same and it actually has different definition. Yeah, that's one, that's one venue of how using the, the word in a sentence can help you. But why? is the definition of the word contingent upon the way that the word is spelled. That has to do something to do with something we call etymology. Etymology is the study of the history of the word. So it is how that word has evolved through different languages and time periods. Now different words have different origins in different languages and different times. Again, each language will evolve throughout its duration of being spoken just like you play a telephone game and what you said changes as you go around but also you know each part of the word may be coming <laughs> also from a different place I mean a different language or a different time period as well so when this child asks how do I use this word or how do you use this word in a sentence they can actually decipher how the word is spelled based off of what it means so they can hear okay it means this when um, you study Latin the Latin word for this is blah 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 and you spell that a G H T rather than a uh, G T like you might think right just throwing out there it doesn't actually mean anything those is an example <laughs> Um, and that's how they figure out how to spell the word. Now, let's talk a little bit about the word spelling itself. Now, I'm going to start with something that seems a little bit unrelated, but I'm actually going to start with something we call grammar, which is related to spelling, but it's not exactly spelling. It's like spelling for sentences, right? Grammar. Grammar is something, is how you use the word, right? Correctly or how you use the words in a sentence to form sentence structure correctly. That is grammar, right? Okay, so what does the word grammar actually mean?
word glamour is related to the word glamour, which is related to the word grimoire, grimoire, grimoire. These words, when looked up, actually mean, um, kind of, I don't want to say they exactly mean this, but they in, in, indicate spell casting or they indicate some type of witchcraft or wizardry. Um, the same what happens when you look up the etymology of the word. Um, then we also look at glamour. Glamour is a superficial aspect of something or an outward appearance that's not indicative of what's actually underneath the surface. So it could be a falsehood, right? An apparent appearing to be something but actually being something else. And you know, in slang terms, we call it fake. <laughs> or she fronting, right? <laughs> so this is what this word means, fronting. So these words are fronting <laughs> as a certain definition, and they actually, when you can trace the spell of how it got together, when you can do the etymology of the word, or the etymology, excuse me, when you can do the etymology, because I don't want people who are out there to think I'm saying etymology, because that's a different study. Etymology. When you're talking about etymology of the word, when you can um, trace it back now, you can now see what the word actually means. Not what we believe the word means based upon the context in which we use it today. Which can be different from the origin of which the word comes. How do you find that out? You find it out by the spelling. <laughs> Alright. So another aspect of grammar, which is really, it's, it's, it's like, I'm just going to point this out for fun. It's not like a big long thing. But um, some places call it this, some places call it elementary school, and some places call it grammar school. Well, if you ever thought about grammar school, it's where you learn how to use grammar. Yes. Also, where you learn how to spell, right? Okay, definitely. Um, and these are the ages in which your brain is actually the most moldable to language. During the ages of, I believe, I want to say like six months, but I'm not exactly sure. But I know it's until 12 years of age, your mind is the most pliable and is the most flexible to actually be able to be molded to speak different languages. So you're actually the most susceptible to language and to learning the uses of language at these ages. After 12, most people's brain hardens and is like, blue, 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 blue. I speak this language and that's it. I only operate on this frequency, right? Where some people are just linguistic people and they can shift it out. I tend to be a little bit more of a linguistic person, but that's neither here nor there. The thing is, from generally from back from born probably till age 12, you are most adaptable to learning different languages and accepting different languages. What school are you in till age 12? <laughs> You're in grammar school, right? Where you are actually learning the falsifications of the language. And this is the programming. So this is where you are receiving your programming and perception of the world, how you view things, where your consciousness is going to resonate, and all that so on and so forth. All right? So let's move forward. If you see me peeking over here, it's because I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> All right, so you may you may be asking me, that's great, that's fine. These are great, interesting little tidbits and coincidences or synchronicities <laughs> that are coming together. But why does it matter, Tay? Why does it matter? Okay, well, pretty much as we figured out, apparently by doing this course, you can create or destroy your reality based off of your energy and your perception of that energy okay what do I mean by that um, if you perceive your reality to be bleak then you can create a bleak reality if you perceive your reality to be great and fun even though your reality might be bleak you might be able to create a reality that is great and fun right it's simple all right so how does spelling um, indicate or how does etymology indicate um, the ability to do such things? Well, pretty much 
the tonal sounds or the root words, the roots of these words, the prefixes, the suffixes, the way that the word is spoken, the way that the word sounds, the vibration that that word is carrying emits a frequency. This frequency holds a resonance. Resonance. Resonance is the, the, the vibration as coming out and holds that resonance holds has a certain frequency. All right. <laughs> All right. So it holds to that certain resonance. And this resonance now permeates through your perceived reality. So when you say a word, right, this word goes forth, it is heard perceived by a brain which deciphers it as a speech which deciphers it as a sound and then you, you recognize it as speech and then you interpret it based off of your per, your perceptual reality which is set by your programming of what the word means right okay so now that perception now projects out into your reality what you are going to manifest from it and so that resonance that you projected at first is going to hold that reality and then you're going to interpret it for yourself and now you are going to project back out towards it and understand it from that level so I mean that's like a basic it's really I mean what I'm just simply saying that's really simple because I could get a little what I'm simply saying is the words that you are using are determining your reality Okay, if I keep calling you um, Chelsea, and if you respond to Chelsea as your name, and you grew up your whole life thinking your name was Chelsea, but your mom actually named you Deborah, <laughs> your reality would be that your name is Chelsea, even though your name legally is Deborah. So you see how you see how that works. All right. Anyway, moving forward. Okay, so when this perceived reality is interpreted by you, it is established as your truth or your life. Okay, we just talked about that. The key to changing your reality, which is most effective, is to change the way that you speak. Okay, that's why we do the affirmations. That why, that's why we do positive thought replacements. That's why we do these things. Because by changing our the the way that we speak out into the universe and the way that we speak our reality outward, we actually change the frequency and we actually are able to shift it and manipulate our reality. Okay? Therefore, change changing your words changes your reality. Like we just said. And thus we the same. The pen is mightier than the sword. Now. All of this. Just comes down to understanding. Basic principles. Like frequency and sound. Sound actually created the universe. The big bang. The sound. Came first. Then matter. And everything else came after it. But the bang was first. That sound, okay, was creation, was setting the template or the resonance for creation to unfold upon. So it's the blueprint. So the sounds that you emit as speech are the blueprints upon which your universal experience or your life experience will unfold upon. Okay? And when you're using tonal frequencies that you do not know the true definition of because there is a true definition just like ohm is the true um frequency that holds that is is at yeah is that resonance with the universe okay just like ohm is that sound frequency every tonal frequency every ah ooh eh all of that stuff has a frequency a resonance and it holds that resonance and it means something okay so the farther back we go into language the farther we get and the closer we get excuse me the closer we get to the actual meaning of those words so 
that just a little etymology lesson a little um, history on words and spelling it was long <laughs> I feel like it was long but hopefully that will help a lot of people out with their uh, journey in vision class and I hope this helped you all right yeah We just spoke to Tay Queen and she talked to you about etymology and about language just putting a spell on you. Why is that important this week? What does that have to do with gratitude and abundance? Not necessarily anything. As I said at the beginning, this top, <laughs> the topics in this lecture are going to feel a bit askew. But the reason that I brought that in now when talking about um, what you're reading and how, the, how to interpret what the authors are saying, as I said before, is that if you don't know the history of a word, then you cannot understand why it's being used, right? Or how it's being used or how we're misinterpreting the usage of that word. It doesn't really matter how you interpret the, the words that you are saying as much as you understand the intention behind the words. And that is something that is more difficult to hear if you don't understand the etymology of the word. This is what I mean by that. If I speak to you and I say, hey dude, what's up? And I don't know where that slang com comes from, right? Dude, hey, I mean, where do these words even come from? But yet I'm saying it to you. If you get upset with what I'm saying because you don't like that I use the word dude because you understand the etymology of the word, well, now you're not understanding the intention behind what I'm saying because clearly I'm, I'm saluting you, right? I'm giving you a salutation. I'm saying hello, right? And I'm saying it in a slangish way because I'd like to communicate to you on the level that I understand, right? Now, what if you don't know the etymology of the word, but you simply know the, the intention that someone is using when they say the word? Well, then it takes etymology to a new level. Not only does etymology s serve to strengthen your intention, but at least your intention is there and your ability to read someone's intention is there. So that is what we're trying to get to, um, understanding the author's intention and then secondarily getting to the etymology of what people are using because authors have a unique strength. They can write down everything that they're thinking, which means they can edit it, which means they can put in words that have the intention that they're trying to display to the world built into their text. A lot of times authors do not write their books in the language of their intention. Instead, they utilize their intention through the words. This is what I mean. <laughs> I know that these lectures are getting confusing, but I'm asking you to stay with me or rewind the tape if, if you're confused at, at any point. Authors don't write using intention as their language. They write with intention, meaning they will write, hey dude, what's up? Because they know that you understand, hopefully, that hey dude, what's up is a term, is endearment. Even though dude does not mean something of endearment. <laughs> go look up the etymology of the word dude. However, however, when authors are writing, hey dude, what's up? They're hoping that you're able to glean their intention because sometimes authors just don't have the time to sit there and write a book solely out of words with their etymology in mind, okay? They don't get to sit there and write with each word as it is intended, right? That would take a lot of time. But then every now and again, you get an, a rare author who is able to write as their intention states, utilizing etymology. And that's what strengthens their intention because as long as their intention is there and as long as their audience can understand their intention, regardless of whether or not they agree with them, then the author is at, a, um, the author is at an advantage to other, to other authors. But if they can do, but if the author can not only write with intention, but can utilize etymology when writing so that their intention is strengthened, because people will read the words exactly as they are meant to read, right? They're not just going to be slang, they're going to mean their esoteric meanings. So when people read the words, they will begin not only for the spell to be broken, but 
they will also be able to interpret it easily and translate that to other people because the word, because the language is written in their esoteric meaning. Excuse me, the words are written with their esoteric meaning in mind. Now, I'll tell you, an author that does this is Eckhart Tolle, and so does Don Miguel Ruiz. When you read their words, they write with etymology, meaning as much words as they, as many words as they can utilize with their esoteric meaning they use. What happens is you don't realize it, but as you're reading, the concepts go into you in a very different way than if you were reading a book who did not utilize etymology. So that way, even if you weren't understanding the concepts, it's still going into you. It's like a programming. Tay Queen just said it. She talked about it being a spell. All right. So speaking of breaking free, we're going to talk about breaking free. idea, as I said earlier, is to stay vigil vigilant. So the first step is realization and the second step is staying present. Because once you recognize what it is that the ego is doing, you can no longer stay identified to it as long as you stay present. And Eckhart Tolle explains, yes, there are going to be times when you go back to the ego. Those times, I'm going to tell you, are when you are um, not fully yourself. Perhaps you're sick, not feeling well. Perhaps you are um, in a strenuous situation. But when your life is strained, is strained, not strange. Well, it could be strange too. But when your life is strained, all right, or stressed out in any way, then your ability to interpret the ego's intention gets taken away, it gets more difficult to see. And the reason for that is because the ego capitalizes on situations where you're not at your fullest self. So of course you practice because the only way to understand the ego is with practice because right now you're in a habit. So the only way to break a habit is with replacement of new habits that are healthier. And that is what we give you as guidelines each week in vision class is to continue to stay vigilant by using these techniques. So the idea is to not stop doing morning pages, to not stop doing your intention book and your envision board. Don't stop doing affirmations. This shouldn't stop. This should continue. And as long as it does, you are then bringing in and ushering in constant vigilance. Whether you know it or not, just by those simple actions, you begin to connect the long spaces in between the ego and less and less the ego uh, will be able to manifest itself. It'll actually be where you are more vigilant most of the time as a habit and the ego only resurfaces because it's a lingering old habit that you just have to continue paying attention to but it will be less difficult of a beast to deal with the more that you practice these techniques of remaining vigilant. So in A New Earth, Eckhart Tolle talks about who you think that you are. This is really important because as we talk about manifesting your visions, uh, what's even more important than manifesting your visions in this class are these techniques that we're giving you. Because it's not just, the whole idea of this class is not just to manifest visions as you probably have noticed. The idea of this class is to get you into healthy behavior that allows you to become more full as a human being, which allows visions to manifest to manifest because they happen to be in alignment with who you really are, right? 
your visions, the, the things that you want most strongly in your heart, you're meant to have. But you can't connect to them if you don't know who you are. And who you are is thus someone who is then in alignment with their life's purpose, right? Because whether or not you know your life's purpose, you're still going to have visions that you'd like to manifest. And they're going to constantly lead you to a new sense of self, a new sense of purpose. So who you really are is very difficult to figure out, right? But you can know who you are not. Now, I did say this in the women who we really are, uh, almost verbatim, the, the series. But I talked about knowing who you are not is the key to knowing who you are. Um, and what this means is, again, do you think of yourself as the ego or do you think of yourself as yourself and what's the difference and how do you know which one you're thinking of yourself as? Well, of course, Eckhart Tolle gives you um, a myriad of exercises that I'm going to list at the end of this lecture. Who you really are depends on what you perceive as your needs and also what you place value on in your life. So, for example, some of us hang out with people we really don't like, or sometimes we do things that are not of us, or perhaps we work at jobs that we don't like because we're just trying to pay the bills. That is who we connect to as who we are. Whether or not we really want to be a painter, or whether or not we really want to be a cake designer, it doesn't matter who we really want to be. Who we are is what we manifest now, the things that we do now, right? So as you can see, I'm recording for, to you right now in from a space that I have manifested through the help of my YouTube viewers, right? I'm recording with a lens. I'm recording with uh, lights. I even have jewelry in my ear that have manifested all as a result of not just vision class, but these techniques that I use in vision class. These lights that I'm using that you can't see that makes everything look really clear was one time a vision. This camera was one time a vision. It was a hope. It was something I wanted. Here it is right now. Of course, it just so happened to manifest during vision class. A lot of times per people perceive that as a, a temporal thing. Well, hey, had you not asked for it before vision class, it wouldn't have manifested in vision class. But even I don't see that as a coincidence because nothing's a coincidence. <laughs> so the fact that, it, that, that, that the benefits of my harvest have, re have been uh, sown, excuse me, the fact that the benefits of my harvest have been reaped during this class, I find to be no coincidence. All of these things were once a vision. But this manifest, these visions manifesting reflect who I really am, right? Ambitious, entrepreneurial, producer. Different things that I perceive myself as are happening through the manifestation of my vision. Do you understand where I'm saying with that? So, so if you don't go after your visions, then you don't find out who you really are because you don't manifest things that constantly renew you. Like every time I look up at the screen and I see how clear it is, and every time I go on my MacBook to edit, I'm reminded all of these things came from a vision, which led me to my purpose of being a producer, which is part of who I am, right? But I couldn't even arrive at that point. I couldn't even arrive at that concept if I didn't have a vision that I decided to go after. And part of this is in the uh, concept of abundance, right? Because you're not abundant in receiving things if you don't accept your good. This is a constant recurring theme in like every book we've done during this class so far. So far, you've talked. About, we've talked about accepting our good. What does that mean? Eckhart Tolle speaks about it. Creative visualization. Shakti Gawain spoke about it. Julia Cameron, Henriette, and Klauser all spoke about accepting your good. Well, what is your good? The idea that God wants for you what you want for you. This is also in week six, recovering a sense of abundance in the artist's way. It's a recurring theme. Why do you think that that is? Because you are part of the, <laughs> you are part of the whole. If God, if, if God can, if God can re restore alignment to the universe by having storms which allow plants to grow, which then after a sun, after the sun hits these plants, allows us to have crops that we can then put into our bodies, which are called sustenance. If God can do that, why would God not then do that for you on your level of whatever it is that you want? Now, the idea is not to have things. The idea is to be fulfilled, be versus have. Yes, you will have tangible physical items. We do live in a physical universe, all right? But you will never fully own them. They will be something that you temporarily have. And just understand that. 
But nonetheless, just because I have these lights, right, and just because I have this camera equipment is never going to take away from the fact of who I am, who I am being this producer regardless. I still have the knowledge, right? We talked about that last week. I still have the knowledge. I still have the ability, right? Whether or not I, I possess physical, tangible items with which to get that knowledge out there is very different. But nonetheless, I have it, right? Right. Okay. So the idea is being fulfilled in all of these activities that you're doing, being fulfilled in all the things that you'd like to achieve for yourself. Because otherwise, when you have, it's just thwarted wanting. It's just empty, right? It's just for, for crap's sake that I have these things. No, there's a sense of fulfillment that happens every time that I go edit on this software. There's a sense of gratitude. Thank God for these people. Every time. Right? Like, thank God, I don't have this without them. But because, but because I asked, because I accepted that, yes, I deserved something, right? I deserve to manifest my dreams and I'm going to try. Because I accepted my good, people were then able to hear me and donate and contribute where they could. And that gives me a sense of abundance. But not only me, they've given, right? They've taken out of themselves to give to the whole, which is a fractal, right? They create a fractal. They create a pattern for more things to build on. But without giving of themselves, with just keeping the information to themselves, this is also discussed in Eckhart Tolle, when you just keep the information to yourself, when you just keep the items to yourself, and when you just keep the concepts to yourself, right? Then you don't create a fractal. Then you don't create something to build on. You don't create a foundation. You don't create a pattern. You just allow things to exist as they are. You never give back to yourself in that way, and you never give to others in that way. In fact, I believe that these cameras and that this lighting and that all of this is, is, has manifested so that I can get out a message that is clearer, that people trust more because it is of today's technology, right? I could speak all of this on my soapbox outside, but there's a difference between me speaking it outside and me speaking it into this camera, right? That's that sense of abundance because I'm letting information out that I have. Other people are able to then receive it I create a fractal in the universe. I create a pattern for which there is now, there's now a pattern people can build on, right? Without vision class, would people be able to share their, would people have a community to share their uh, envision boards on? Perhaps, but this is now one place that you can do it, right? Without vision class, would there be a place for people to dump all their information into one common source so that we can all draw from it like a bank, like I said in the first week? There wouldn't be. So you have to put it out there in, in order for there to be abundance, right? There's nothing else, there's nothing to grow from if there's no foundation. So you have to put it out there. And that is how you reap abundance. And that is also a demonstration of accepting your good. Because I could simply say to myself, I don't think I can do that. That's hard. That's a lot of work. Because it is. It is hard. It is a lot of work. And I don't think I can do it. But by doing it, by putting myself out there, by, by really trying it, things then manifest things come into the space to manifest so that I am able to actually deliver what it is that's in my heart. And that's abundance, and that is how it happens. Okay, so to just go back to the ego for a moment, because first of all, 
you're gonna read this in A New Earth if you're reading A New Earth, but Eckhart Tolle talks about the difference between good and bad being that they are just label terms. They're not necessary, necessarily real. When, you, when we wor use words like good and bad, granted, like I talked about earlier, it is our intention when we use the words good and bad. But the truth is, if you really examine, not just etymology, but if you, end, if you examine the fact that good and bad is judging, um, we have to begin to, to take, for me, I try to consciously take the words good and bad out of my vocabulary where I can, because consciously, if I'm, if I'm vigilant of my wording, um, I recognize that they're terms of judgment, so I like to not use them. However, um, again, it's all about your intention when you're using it. If you, if you call someone a bad person, then you're judging them. But if you say it was a bad situation, perhaps you are judging the situation, but your intention is quite different because you're not just labeling a person, you're labeling a situation, which is a bit different. The reason we're talking about labels and the reason we're talking about judgment is because we have to go back and talk about the ego, which the ego is a lot of times defined as bad. It's bad thing. It's bad. It's bad. It's an aspect of you. It's always going to be there. There's never going to be a time when you're 150 million percent in full awareness because this is the point of duality. Now, of course, if you are an ascended being, you're not going to have the ego. But uh, if you're an ascended being, then you're also not going to manifest as a physical being as well. You'll be a spirit. So as long as you are a physical being, there will be ego in you. However, we want to diminish the aspect of the ego. And we also want to, we want to diminish our identification with the ego. The ego can be part of us. It does not need to be us, right? So Eckhart Tolle talks about three ways that the ego treats the present as a means to an end, um, as an obstacle, or as an enemy. And the reason you need to know that is because of time, right? And this is what I mean by that. Some of you may or may not notice this. I'll give you a story for, of mine for an example. But for example, I used to, when I was living in New York City and I would get on the train and I would be getting late to somewhere, I would be on the train and I'd be tapping my foot on the ground, you know, your foot like that taps on the ground while you're getting nervous. And I would be like, you know, totally um, jittery and constantly thinking about what would happen if I were late. Now, I may or may not be late. Uh, but sometimes when you actually get to the destination point when you're late and you have all this anxiety about being late because everything is meant to be, perhaps your job doesn't open till 10 minutes late. So being late was relative. You weren't actually late at all. It didn't really matter. Or sometimes you get to the destination point and uh, the destination point is burned down. You didn't even have to be there in the first place. Or sometimes you get there, you're late, no one cares. Sometimes you get there, you're late and you get fired, which you might perceive as bad. We talked about bad and good. You might perceive it as bad, but oh, now you have 10 weeks off to spend all that money that you got. Oh, where? When did you get the money? You just got a check right now. You didn't know you were going to get. Oh, hallelujah. I got 10 weeks off. I mean, that's happened to me. The point is, I didn't get fired though. The point is you absolutely judge time, right? As good and bad. And a lot of times people who are time obsessed are also of the ego. Why? Time is, time occurs relatively um, meaning, if I am to say the sun is setting at night, well, the sun's not really setting. The sun always shines. It's just that the earth turned a certain amount of degrees and now I don't see the sun anymore, but it's still there, right? And of course, if I'm in Asia, the sun is setting at a different time than it's setting for me. Even if I call Asia right now and the sun is setting and it's not setting for me, it's only relative. So time is psychological and time is also actual. So what I mean is because you cannot fully separate yourself from the ego, you're going to live on clock time. We have to do something to measure where we're, you know, it's something, you know, even if we were in ancient times, people would still be like, the sun sets in the West and the crops harvest at the beginning of every new season. What are you talking about? But the point is when they say that, you know what they're saying, we're still using we're still using actual time, right? Things, events that happen in sequence from one another. But then you have psychological time. The psychological time aspect is of the ego. Now we've utilized, again, this is how the pain body evolved. This is how the ego evolved. There was such a thing as thought. There was such a thing as emotion. There was such a thing as time at one point in time, right? There, there, there was, right? We understood as things as, we understood things as relative, right? We understood that we were in the present and other things were in the past. We understood that, but we didn't necessarily say that that was a bad or good thing. The arbitration of the labeling started happening after the ego was strengthened, right? So thought became, we became thought obsessed. We became in our minds, right? 
thoughts that aren't even real, making assumptions, right? taking things personally that weren't meant to be personal. Uh, then we began to derive the pain body, right? Where uh, fight or flight emotions actually became fear, anger, uh, sadness, depression, right? These emotions evolved. And then on your last tier, you have, uh, you know, time. Time becoming psychological. Time being, I'm late. And what does that even mean, right? I'm late. It's bad. I'm late. They're going to get mad at me right? Or I'm late. Uh, what's going to happen? Nothing's going to really happen. Um, the only time that being late matters is if you die and you, you die after you die. That, then that might be a concern. I mean, I might be a little worried, like how did that just happen? But other than that, there's really no, I mean, there's no time schedule, right? Time merely exists as a marker. It does not need to exist as a psychological entity. But why does that happen? What does that mean? What is time? thought you'd ever ask. We're going to get Tay Queen in on the subject. She's going to talk to you about time. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it because this concept for people, including myself, is just like a concept, you know. So let's uh, hear from our, again, our resident field expert, Tay Queen, about time and uh, give you some food for thought. Okay, so I'm going to mention really quickly, not very, very long, about this subject of time. And it could get really long <laughs> because, I don't know, I've, med I've done some meditations and I've contemplated these things and I'm always thinking um, all the time. And so I came up with a model. Now, I can't quite find the model right now. Probably for good reason, because I probably showed it to you, and I don't need to. <laughs> I don't need to copyright it first. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't have the model in front of me, but I can't explain it to you. So, how? What I'm about to explain to you is somewhat like the concept of psychology, but not in an application to a person, but an application to time itself. Okay. Or the universe, or the, or the universe. So what I am speaking about is the behaviors of time and creation, or the universe, right? Okay. So, hey, you want to know how time works? Well, we often perceive time as a straight line or something that is linear, right? We generally look at past being behind us, the present being where we are right now, and the future being right there in front of us, right? Well, this may or may not be true. <laughs> and as you get into the study of metaphysics, you will further contemplate how and why this may or may not be true. But for those of us who do not have quantum physics degrees, I have come up with <laughs> a model that simply lets us understand how time truthfully works. This model will not only describe our correlation, our perception of time, but it will describe perception of time as creation, so as time was, time is relative to the creator, or the creator source, or the source point. It'll explain, then it'll explain how we perceive time, and then how time is actually flowing for us, okay? Some big claims, right? Okay, <laughs> here I go. All right, now if you may picture for one second a dot. I'm going to make a circle with my hands, okay? We're going to pretend this is our circle. Let's make a dot. This looks obscene. Um, okay, let's, let's picture a dot in the middle of that circle. Now, that dot, I'm going to make it my eye, 
Now my the pupil of my eye is now what we're calling the creation point. Okay? And from this creation point, we are now going to perceive that all things emanate from it holistically outward so an emanation would look like this right coming from that center point something like when you drop a pebble in some water and then it ripples outward like that okay so the creator emitted consciousness consciousness now experiences time outward like that piece of water that ripples outward or the, the rock that was dropped into the water and the water is now reflecting within the ripples. Okay? So that's how the creator experiences consciousness. Or experiences time. How me, you experience time would be on the circle itself. And our personal, each personal person, each person will have a different relative experience. Now, the collective experience is comprised within the circle. The individual experience would be something like a orbit around the circle. So it would be us going circularly around the point, touching that circle whenever we came around, back to the center point. So... We want to reach that center point. That would be like another center point. That would be another center point, And we just keep coming all the way around. Now obviously, this is not my model. <laughs> this, is, this may be a little confusing to certain people. I don't know. Sure, may cut this up. <laughs> um, I don't know. But anyway. So each of our individual consciousness. Each of our individual consciousness experiences is going to... Um, be like that spiral going around that circle. Okay? Now, is this actually the eminence of time? No, it's not. We're experiencing what's like a snapshot from the beginning of creation. And we're kind of riding that snapshot as it goes outward and then as it comes back in. Right? Um, yeah. So, we'll ride that consciousness or that generalized understanding of truth. And we'll, we'll write it like the spiral. And each time where we have a point in which we come back to meeting that consciousness, we might perceive this as a time where we are fully in the moment or we are fully being focused. This is what meditation is training you to do. This is um, it's training you to align yourself back to that resonance. And then from that resonance, be able to align yourself back to creator consciousness. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of deep. But yeah. And we experience these things spur sparingly and, and periodically or, or what seems to be randomly in moments that we call coincidences or synchronicities. Synchronicities are reflective of our journey coming to a point where we intersect with the reality that was emitted from the creator consciousness. We experience it as a moment of total oneness where we are now becoming, we feel like we're overwhelmed, or not overwhelmed, but we feel like we are enveloped in a feeling of peace or serenity or balance, calmness. And, um, Sometimes this can come after a great trauma. Sometimes this can come in the midst of great happiness. There's different things that can trigger it, but whatever it is, it, that's what we're talking about. And these set points are set up to teach us the way in which we can find the creator on our own path. All right? Now, if you'll study the sum total of the times that you, you've had different things intervene in your life and different um, synchronicities, some of them are going to be great, some of them are not going to be so large or grand, it might just be something small. But each of these um, things are significant. They are the miracles that, she's, that they're um, talking about, she was talking about in creative, um, in the artist way, excuse me. <laughs> These are God's ways of speaking to you, pretty much, or the Creator's way of 
talking to you and letting and reawakening a certain consciousness within you. Each of these moments is going to activate something within your mind or in your brain that is going to bring you back to creator consciousness. All right? And so my model pretty much functions to just show the behaviors of all these things so that we can correlate how this works, how it's working out for us, and and so we're going to understand deeply deeper more our, our levels of growth and not become so frustrated thinking that life is linear and that we have to grow straight up. Even a plant doesn't grow straight up. Sometimes the plant will be growing crooked, then it'll grow the other way, then it'll grow the other way. Eventually, you know, it'll be straight and it'll be cool. But when it first starts out, it might grow a little crooked at first. So we need to be reassured in the fact that, hey, you know, it's okay that we might have um, intermission periods um, within our growth. This is just us coming to a point of un understanding, actually, really. This is coming to a point of understanding what was given to us. So this is us processing, recalibrating, and then emitting a new reality based off of what we've learned from that information. And that information, again, can be... Um, can be um, these moments of synchronicity or miracles or whatever the case may be. And, um, oh yeah, do check us out every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Conversations with the Queen. We will be talking about these topics and so much more on the show. So if you are interested in learning more about these, not just from people like me, from people who do this. This, this is what they do for a, lot, a living. This is their life. They do this. So if you want to learn more about that, you can visit conversationswiththequeen.blogspot.com or you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com slash conversationswiththequeen. As always, joy, love, peace, and blessings. Let us now take the time to thank Tay Queen for her time and wisdom and affirm the following. Tay's businesses, Gemini Creations and Conversations with the Queen, are manifesting a wealth of abundance, recognition, and support. Ashe. Let us also visit her website, Gemini Creations, at the link listed in the description box below, and check out her show, Conversations with the Queen, every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the link to which is also listed in the description box below. So a really, really huge concept that Eckhart Tolle talks about is as within, so without. We are going to cover this extensively next week when we talk about Greg Braden, uh, the Isaiah effect. So in lieu of discussing that, I'm just going to talk to you guys really briefly um, about inner space. Now, um, all right. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about as within, so without momentarily. But the first idea is, the first idea of understanding inner space. 
So as Eckhart Tolle speaks, uh, he, he discusses object consciousness and spatial con consciousness. Object consciousness being this couch, spatial consciousness being, or space consciousness being everything that is not this object, this couch, right? Space, air. Um, however, the idea of space is that, and this is, this is what we, again, we're going to talk about this next week. We're going to talk about the end. We start talking about quantum physics. But space is really more abundant <laughs> than the actual object. Meaning, there's more space in between and around things than there are actual objects, but yet space is that uh, which comprises even the objects. The smaller and smaller that you go, literally if you take a microscope into your body and you go deeper and deeper into the body, you actually find that there's more space. You would think, hey, if I go look at my atoms right now inside of my body and I mag magnify the atoms, I'm gonna see just a bunch of atoms. When in actuality, when you magnify an atom, you see more and more space. Why is that? Because there is a lesson to even be learned biologically from ourselves, which is that space, or the concept of space, is not really nothingness. It's everything. So we have to understand things that we perceive as just space and as just air and just this and that. We have to begin to perceive those things as being the fullness from which we have come right? We don't physically see God, right? We can't write a letter to God like we write a letter to Santa at Macy's, right? We can't write God and be like, excuse me, I don't like this. I mean, we can, but where are we going to send it? To the North Pole? That's an address. Let's put a stamp on it and see if the mailbox, uh, the mailman delivers that to, mail to Jesus. No one's going <laughs> to, I mean, we could put a stamp on it, um, but let's see if the mailman actually delivers your mail. It's not happening. So, um, uh, <laughs> That being said, if God, if God is not physical that we can see, then God must be like all the other things that we cannot see that we take for granted. So one of the things that um, Eckhart Tolle talks about, I do this, Tay Queen recommends that we do this, um, you'll see this repeated everywhere uh, if you just take a really close look, especially at spiritual texts, uh, that you want to focus on your breathing. So the word inspire, in meaning talking about etymology in meaning inspire meaning spirit means uh the spirit within right or the spirit in you so when you inspire you actually breathe you take air in so when you do deep breathing when you do and that's not even deep breathing when you do deep breathing you're taking spirit in why because you're not living without your breath right if you're not breathing, you're not alive, period. That's the main way we know if someone's alive. So life literally is breath. So the more that you concentrate on your breath, what you're saying is you're being attuned and aware and grateful for your life. Not only that, but you're bringing God in just by the very nature of the word inspire. So you're doing all of that when you do deep breathing. And Eckhart Tolle talks about doing deep breathing. Uh, Tay Queen recommended to me, she said, you know, if you do deep breathing 25 times a day, if you just stop and just breathe for 25, you know, 25 deep breaths a day, she said, you're going to see health benefits. You're going to see benefits in your life. You're going to see greater manifestation of things. I've tried it. It works. I'm here to tell you. And it makes sense. And it makes sense. Why not go back to the most simple thing? The one thing that makes you alive is your breath. Period. The fact that I have a personality and all of this does not matter without my breath. Because if I'm not breathing, I can't share anything with you. Right? So the breath is extremely important. So you want to concentrate on your breath. And then what you begin to do as you concentrate on your breath, when you start getting good at that, is what's called inner body awareness. You shift your attention from your breath to your inner body. And let me explain that. When I close my eyes, and he gives you this exercise earlier, but he gives you exercises on body awareness. Um, when I close my eyes and I think of my hands, right? I just think of my hands, right? I just put my attention on my hands. I'll begin to feel what's called aliveness. Life. Right. So as you as you can breathe in air and get in more of that space and you become more right, because you would think, well, what's breathing going to make me more breathing makes you more right. Not less. It makes you more of yourself, more conscious, more everything. You can do this now with other body parts by shifting your attention to them. So if you think of your ears, all of a sudden, it's not that you feel blood in your ear or that you feel like little parasites running around in your ears. You actually feel a vibration or, or an energy, if you will. You'll feel energy going to that place just by putting your attention on it. 
And the more you do this, you start doing it to your entire body. Like right now, I have complete body awareness. And you become so much more that you almost shift your aura. Your aura almost beams after you do that. But the more that you do that, again, you have to do this as a practice. The more that you practice it, the more it becomes habitual. The less and less you have to focus your intention on it, the more it just becomes you and the more you become. I know it's weird, but it's really it's really what happens. This is something I highly recommend to you. It's not something that's in the course. It is something I'll recommend to you. And it's something I'll recommend that you do when we, when we get to the meditation chapter. So keep that in mind. touch on um there's two more concepts i want to touch on before i conclude the lecture for today the first one is your inner and outer purpose and the reason you need to know about your inner and your outer purposes is because one does not exist without the other but many times we're too focused on our outer purposes now when you read the class syllabus for vision class and you see um vision class utilizing your visions to figure out your life's purpose. You're like, all right, who am I, firefighter? All right, I'm excited about this class, okay. My computer programmer, what am I gonna find out? Yes, you are a firefighter. Yes, you are a computer programmer. But when you go back to like week one or two, when I started talking about your visions as being pieces of the puzzle, that when you pan out and you see the puzzle together, you see a life's purpose, you pan back out and you see more life's purposes connected to another purpose and you pan out. That's your outer purpose. Notice that it always changes. Notice that it's always connected to another purpose. Notice that it never stops. Notice that there are many life purposes. Why are we noticing this? Because this is what Eckhart Tolle talks about with the outer purpose. I totally did not even realize that that was synchronistic, but it is. Your outer purpose is part of your ego, right? That's your duality, that's your physical purpose. So you have inner and you have outer, just like you have breathe in, breathe out. So you have duality all the time, right? Breathing out means you're returning spirit back to the environment. Breathing in means you're bringing spirit into you, right? This idea of abundance and gratitude is when you breathe out, that's what you want to think. When you breathe in, you want to think God in, consciousness out to everybody else, right? That's what you want to think. Well, when you have an inner and an outer purpose, it's the same thing. It's the same idea of duality right? So your outer purpose is your physical purpose. It's the purpose that you fulfill that helps everybody else physically, um, perhaps spiritually. But your inner purpose is quite simple. Your inner purpose is just to exist, just to be. Because if you don't have an inner purpose, then your outer purpose has no meaning. So for example, if your purpose is to become a doctor and you're operating on people all day and there's no joy and no fulfillment in operating on people, then ultimately your operating on people does not have a, doesn't have a fulfillment and loses fulfillment for you and you stay not vigilant with it, right? It becomes your ego. Your outer purpose is all ego. Your inner purpose is, not, is all awareness. So if you can marry the two concepts together and you're constantly aware as you have your outer purpose, it doesn't matter what your outer purpose is as long as your inner purpose is realized, as long as you're connected to being. Being, of course, is the idea that you just exist, the idea that you are of the spirit, right? Of God, you're of that spirit. You have, that is who you really are. And once you have that piece, okay, I'm really, because for example, I used to, and he talks about this in this book, I used to wanna be famous, right? I wanna be a famous, whatever, entertainer. And as time went on, I was like, well, if I'm a famous entertainer, well, then what the hell am I doing? entertaining for just to be entertaining or am I entertaining for some reason and because I couldn't find a reason I mean other than to make people laugh because I couldn't find a real reason I realized it wasn't going to be sustainable I realized that people could take that from me I realized that people could overtake me right if I had a paparazzi in front of me that could overtake me if someone said something nasty about me that would overtake me so it couldn't be that I wanted to be a famous entertainer that couldn't be my purpose so I scratched that, went back to the drawing board, and I started doing videos like this, which were more fulfilling. As you probably have seen, I started off Sugar Free TV doing makeup and hair. And here I am this day doing vision class. Now, what do you think I had an epiphany about? 
It wasn't that I was supposed to do makeup and hair for the rest of my life. It was that I was supposed to speak to people about what I'm speaking to you about now. And although people have not valued it, right? I have way less views now than I have ever had. It doesn't matter because the fulfillment is there. Because I know what I'm doing is connecting to somebody. Okay? Someone can go put hair and makeup on and they can feel great about themselves and they can hate their lives. Or you can put no hair and makeup on and I can talk to you just like this and you'll get a greater sense of who you are than you would have ever doing hair and makeup. Or in fact, now that I do hair and makeup, as you see here, now that I do, did do my hair and makeup, it has a greater purpose, right? It, it means something different when I do it now. It looks better, in fact. I don't even know if you guys have noticed the evolution of my makeup from when I started to even now. For me to beat a face like this four years ago, I would never be able to. That looks flawless, that looks like um, clean, that looks natural. I mean, come on, do you see the eyebrows I had at the beginning? Look like windshield wipers. I mean, it was not okay. Because what happened? What changed? What shifted? I shifted. I shifted to consciousness. And therefore, it, it flows through everything I do. It seems, it seems to make no sense, but that's actually how it works. It goes that way. I can do makeup all day long and never get it. But if I get, if I get the point of consciousness, now whatever I do becomes conscious. Whatever I do becomes better. It becomes more, like I just said. So, as I, as I want to just reiterate to you guys, um, this may not make sense to you, and I said this before, but that's why you want to do the exercises. Because even if you don't know why you're doing the exercises, as you manifest, and as things start happening for you, and you're like, wait a minute, Shira said things will happen. Is it a result of doing the exercises? Yes. Now there's a point to do the exercises. Now the consciousness has already happened to you, whether you know it or not. So when you go back and you le look at these lectures, and when you read these books, now they have a new sense of divinity. They have a new sense of purpose for you because you've already seen the results. And that's why I have you doing all this work because I want you to see the results. I, th this isn't about I didn't do morning pages today. No, this is an understanding that because I do morning pages, I become conscious. And because I come, become conscious, doing the morning pages now have a purpose. Because at the beginning, they're not going to have a purpose for you. You're not going to understand them. Who cares? Do them, receive the benefit, then come back and understand why you're doing them is what I'm trying to teach here. thing I want to talk about again we're going to touch on this next week with Greg Braden but I loved this part of the chapter is um, your your outward movement and your um, return movement so Eckhart Tolle talks about this in chapter 10 um, he first of all discusses the fact that the earth you know scientists call it the Big Bang Theory and let me just address this really fast a lot of times science and religion cannot coexist because of fundamentalism but it has nothing to do with reality I do not see an earth that God could not create science. I mean, if science exists independent of God, then God is not that powerful. So God has created science. So if there were a Big Bang, God created it. If the heavens and earth were created in seven days and it appeared to be a Big Bang from what we see, why are we upset about that? I'm not. So I'm just going to start with that, with anyone who's just not reading the intention in the book and you're reading the actual words and you're not reading through it, read through it and understand that period, point blank, uh, scientifically speaking, the way that the earth has developed is almost like an outgrowing, right? Like so a flower starts off as a bud and it opens up. This is how the earth was created. And it was. We read, you know, if you're, for example, to read the Bible, you read how the earth is created in layers. That's called outgoing. And this is mirrored. Um, and reflected in our own lives. So us as human beings, we start off as a bud, we start off as a little baby, we get bigger, guess what happens? We start shriveling back up and we die, right? So that's outward movement, the outgoing, excuse me, the outgoing movement, and then you have the return movement when you shrivel back up and die. So 
as we talked about just for two seconds earlier, and we did say we were gonna discuss it with Greg Braden, as above, so below. This is a concept that means as within, so, excuse me, as within, so without. So anything that I see on an outer manifestation has to be reflected inside of me, right? So you can look at a plant and understand what's happening with humans. You can look at a tsunami and understand what's happening with the entire world. I mean, this is how it is, right? Always duality, always reflective. So when you think of outward movement, you, you understand that if the earth has projected itself outward, it has to eventually go back inward from whence it came, right? Just like humans do, just like animals do, and you return back to your source, right? All right. So if that's, if that's true, then what's happening now? Well, the time that's happening now is what he's calling the new earth, is now that return movement of the earth. Not of just you, of the earth. Now, it's also being reflected in you. If you're reading this book and absorbing the concepts, then you are experiencing return movement. What's a return movement? A demolishing, a dissolution of form or ego. So right now we're experiencing the dissolution of the ego. Not right now today, maybe the next 50 years, but right now in terms of the time that we are experiencing now, right? He gives a really great example. He talks about that fact that virtually no animals were harmed in the tsunami of, the tsunami of 2004 because they're so connected to the whole that they just understood to move. We didn't, we died. So now it's our turn to understand the connectedness. And we're experiencing a return movement. A really good, uh, wonderful, I mean, this was the most wonderful, poignant thing I think he said in the entire book. He talks about the return movement in terms of our age, right? Okay, this is temporal time. This is not conceptual time. Although it can be conceptual psychological time if you look at it in terms of people call age 30 old. I'm 31, people will call me old. Well, that's psychological. But the fact is, when I'm 60 and I know that I'm probably halfway to my death, then perhaps I could be considered old. But that's just relative. But we're talking about temporal time here. Yes, Sherry, I just, look, I just said a lot right there. I know I'm confusing. Rewind the tape. So what he's saying is that from birth until a certain age, has anyone watched my Phases of Rebirth video last week that I told you to watch? If you didn't, watch it now and recognize that Phases of Rebirth touches on this as well. Because you get to the end of the cycle, guess what, you get reborn around your 30s. Now that's not half of your life or anything, um, but the, still the idea is that around that time, if you do, again, if, if it's done correctly or if it's done in this pattern that we see, you're going to have the return movement even quicker. And the return movement simply means you go back inward. It does not mean you die um, necessarily. But Eckhart Tolle equates it to when you die because usually the pattern is that people get to age 40 or 50 when their physical bodies start the return movement. And that's why he talks about death because death is physical. And he explains how ill-prepared we are for death in general, right? We see a sanitized version of death. When we go see someone at a wake, we see them in a, in a casket with makeup on their face. But that's not death, right? People people have this attachment so much to physical bodies that we uh, we bury bodies. Okay, this is not a judgment. This is the truth. We bury bodies. There's nothing in that body. There's nothing in there. It's just a concept. But that's what he's trying to say. We are so connected to form that we have not even gotten out of that what we were supposed to get out of it. That person's death, right? Understanding that person's death, why they died. So. What happens is, he's describing, at, when you're born and you're doing the what's called the outward movement, what you're doing from like birth to half of your life approximately, and I say it in phases of rebirth as uh, the rebirth phase, but what you're doing during that time is you're absorbing, okay? You're growing and thus you're absorbing information. You're not, you're not inward yet, right? You're all about form, right? You're all about relationships and um, acquiring things and understanding success in terms of things. Oh, I'm successful because I have a car or I'm successful because I have a house. But what is intended to happen in phases of rebirth, it's intended to happen in your thirties. In his model, it's intended to happen about halfway through your life. But what actually happens is what's called a return movement, this rebirth phase. And what happens during this phase or what happens during return movement is that your body begins to shrivel. Your physical form begins to go away. It's almost a way that nature forces you to look inward. And if you're not vigilant, you will harden the ego. You will create 
an everlasting ego. I did talk about this in phases of rebirth in a different way. I said some people don't get it until the next phase of rebirth. That's what he's talking about. You sometimes just harden, right? If you don't learn it, then you attach to it, right? Either you're going to awaken from the ego or you're going to attach to the ego. It's going to get even more attached. This is most people, right? But what but what the return movement is intended to do is because you're getting older, because you're no longer of the same looks, your hair is getting gray, things are shriveling, things are not resilient as they used to be, the universe is trying to force you into understanding that these things are transient. Hey, one day you're going to die. One day this won't be here. So let's take this time. And instead of using this time to say, I'm getting old. Can somebody take me to the grocery store? Instead of doing all of that, going in, taking the spirit in, right? Taking the spirit in. And that is the whole point of a new earth. to allow the return movement to do what it's meant to do, which is detach from the ego, to understand, ah, things are fading. But people don't do that, right? People, my beauty is fading, and they spend the entire life, the entire rest of their life trying to get their beauty back through facial surgeries, all right, dyeing our hair, right, trying to look young, because we're so attached with the ego. It does not mean that we can't work out and look good, all right? It doesn't mean we can't work out and look good, and it doesn't mean that we can't stay physically fit, but the idea is to dissolve the ego because there is no place for that physical body. Eventually, it is going to be 80 years old, and there will be very little physical exercise and dyeing of the hair and facial, uh, you know, surgery that's going to really rectify the us that we were in our 20s, period. There's, I mean, look at all the 80-year-olds who have fa uh, facelifts and all type of plastic surgery and wigs and everything else, and everybody's looking at them like that. I mean, that's not you. When you look like that, sort of, you were 20, and you don't even look, you don't even look a semblance of that. So it's, it's all about refocusing your attention. Um, it's all about refocusing your at attention into your um, inner purpose. And of course, he recommends this through awakened doing. So we're going to do, right? We're still going to be physical human beings. We're still going to go to parties and we're still going to hang out with friends. But we can do this with awakened doing. And he uh, presents three aspects of maintaining vigilance. And I actually need you to read up on them because I here do not have the time to discuss them. But they are acceptance, enjoyment, and enthusiasm. And of course, um, interestingly enough, enthusiasm is in Theos, which is in God or the God within. So um, awakening yourself and remaining vigilant by bringing God in is the constant theme that we're talking about here. And of course, Eckhart Tolle gives you a lot of bullet points as to how to achieve that. So that being said, see you guys next week um, after the midterm. We're going to start all over. We're going to continue with our return movement um, by giving you a break. And of course, I'm going to discuss uh, the Isaiah effect for those of you who have read that. So um, if you've taken your break now, well, now you can focus on the Isaiah effect. And um, we're going to work on that return movement a little bit uh, conceptually as we go forward in vision class from henceforth. Because now that we've understood all of these big concepts, now we're going to hammer them down, uh, the, con the concepts rather, we're going to begin hammering them down and solidifying them with a lot of tangible evidence, which is one of my favorite pieces because a lot of people say, well, how do you know that? And how can you say that this is really true? And this makes no sense right? This class. I don't understand what's happening. Now we're going to give you tangible concepts coming up that are going to really help you to see where all of this information comes from and how physically to access this information, right? Real tangible ways to grasp what we've been talking about for the last six weeks. And of course, as always, um, 
Thank you so much for devoting your time to us. Thank you for getting to the halfway point with us. Hopefully you're going to see the return movement. And a lot of times what does happen during the return movement is your crops begin to manifest because you've done all of the work. Now it's time for you to take God in, to go back inward and everything begins to come to you. Right? So all of these concepts somehow align with each other uh, one way or the other. And hopefully this was a really good lecture for you. Hopefully it was eye-opening. And if not, stay tuned weeks 7 through 12 where we're really going to uh, make these concepts concrete with tangible evidence. Peace and peace.